there's no no question that I get into a zone where I'm totally focused on doing what I'm doing and it doesn't really matter what else is going on. Hello, hello. Another episode of Photography Radio is here for you. My name is Tomasz and it really does mean a lot to me that you decided to listen to today's show. I have a wonderful conversation today for you. I talked to Richard I. Anson, Australian travel photographer who I guess visited and photographed almost every possible country in the world. He worked with National Geographic TV, with Lonely Planet. Um, he truly made travel photography the core of his existence. I'm convinced you will find many of his thoughts and ideas valuable and possibly applicable to your own photographic endeavors. Enjoy my conversation with Richard I. Anson. Can you imagine your life without photography? No? Then you will love this show. And it doesn't matter if you're a DSLR, a mirrorless, or a mobile phone shooter. We're here to help your photography grow. This is Photography Radio. Okay, Richard, so this show is all about keeping, you know, our listeners inspired, about helping them with uh, maintaining their photographic passion. And uh, you seem to know how one should be going about it. You have been photographing the world for more than 30 years now. And uh, having the privilege of meeting you in person, I, I can personally testify <laughs> that you are still a, a very, very passionate photographer. How do you stay inspired? Um, look, I just think there's always more great pictures to take. I certainly don't think I'm finished in terms of destinations to go to and new pictures to take. And so that, that really is my inspiration. I just love traveling. I love shooting when I'm traveling. And given there are so many places I haven't been to yet, it's not that hard. I travel about three to three and a half months a year. So, you know, the rest of the time I am, in fact, at home in my office at the computer, like everybody else. Uh, I'm, I'm, when I'm doing that, I'm, not, I'm obviously processing the pictures that I've been shooting, but I'm also planning the next trips. And there's a lot of work goes into planning the trips that don't just happen. You don't just have an idea to go somewhere and then go, not anymore. Um, so there's a lot of research and a lot of background work that goes into the trips, which ultimately means that I make the most of my time when I get there. And for me, that's absolutely crucial because, you know, trips are never long enough. As a photographer, you could always have another 10 minutes, another hour, another day, another week in the same location. So um, the trips are reasonably well organized. I always allow time just to to wander and to follow uh, you know, whatever happens spontaneously. But, you know, I have to deliver. It's pretty important that I get what I went for and to make sure that happens, fair amount of research. So, yes, look, I'm actually only traveling three, three and a half months a year. That's probably a, a part of it too, Thomas. Um, I've always said I could just keep traveling, but I think the reality is coming back, assessing the pictures that I've taken, working on them, delivering them, Every time I do that, to this day, I learn something and I then add that knowledge into my photography on my next trip. So every trip, although I've been doing it, as you say, for 30 years, offers me something new and a new challenge um, in terms of photography. Do, do you mainly work for, for uh, you know, do you have assignments? Do, are you, do you work for clients or are you working for your own portfolio? Um, no, I don't have clients and assignments. The two main reasons for traveling, well, there's three reasons for traveling these days. One is I am doing personal projects, so working on, say, a book, for example. But mostly I lead photography groups now to various parts of the world. So I'll take a group of enthusiast photographers somewhere, usually for about two weeks. And I do three or four international trips a year. Um, and then the other thing, which has always been the basis of my business, is I'm shooting stock. So whether I'm traveling on a personal project or whether I'm leading a group, I'm still shooting images that will ultimately end up with my agent, who is Getty Images now. Yeah, so I, well, I don't do assignments. I, I never really have. Okay. 
I, I found an interview, you know, somebody else did with you. I think it was two, three years ago. I find it on the internet where you said that actually, um, you prefer being alone and traveling solo when, yes. when w to photograph. So how does it work in terms of, you know, um, traveling with a group? Is it not the time where you are actually uh, working on your own uh, images? The, the, there is quite a big difference. I mean, obviously, when people have uh, chosen to come on one of my photography tours, they're there because they want to go to the destination, but hopefully they also want to learn something. The way I set the trips up is I set them up as though I was traveling alone. So the itinerary, the places we go, how the day is spent – is set up as though I was doing that for my own photography and then and essentially people come along for the ride. Now, obviously, things change when you've got 10 or 12 people in terms of some of the logistics. It's a bit slower. It takes longer to get on and off of transport and and not everybody walks, you know, as quickly as I do up a hill or whatever. <laughs> so with those things in mind, it, it is different. But the essential... Um, core of my the day is spent in pursuit of really good pictures and i basically take people along with me so yes my output is probably less because i'm assisting and i'm talking and i'm helping people um but i still do get to shoot a lot of pictures on these trips because that's part of the idea people can learn i think if they're watching a fair amount about the way a photographer actually works in the field they can pick that up, as well as obviously have the personal conversations. You have been photographing for, is it more than 30 years now? Yes, yes, about 32, 33 years. So it's a long time, you know, long process of growing as a photographer. Do, do you experience creative crises or, or creative blocks? No, not not with the photography. Not, not Certainly not when I'm traveling, no. As I said, I, I usually, well, no, not usually, I always know what I intend to shoot, what I hope to achieve on each trip, still being open to the spontaneous possibilities of travel. Um, I think it's sometimes a little bit harder in front of the computer working working through thousands of pictures and getting them ready. Um, I'm probably a much better photographer than I am sitting down working at the computer, put it that way. <laughs> but no, I don't, I, I don't believe that I experience creative block. So do, do you think it has to do with the fact that you are, as you said before, that you are always, um, you know, defining a clear goal uh, be before every, you know, single trip you plan? Yeah, I certainly think that helps. Yeah, totally. You know, I, I know. Look, even if I had no clear goal, I've been doing this so long that I could just turn up anywhere and I would follow my instincts because that's what I do. So although I'm talking about having a clear plan and making the most of my time, I'm still quite capable of being dropped anywhere and coming up with pictures because that's essentially what I do. The planning really just means that I don't waste any time. If I didn't do any planning, I'd have to figure it out, you know, on the ground. And, um, well, it's totally doable, of course, but um, as I said, no trip's ever long enough, so I'd much rather be organised and, and have – you know, a, a fairly uh, clear idea of where I want to go and what I want to do in order to make the most of the time. That, that seems pretty logical to me, given that this is a business. You know, it's not a holiday. I have to get there. I've got a certain amount of time. I've got to get the shots I want and hopefully more than what I actually want and um, and then leave. So, yeah, it's um, it's not just a matter of turning up somewhere nice and wandering around taking pictures as I see them because – I don't believe that ever works in terms of getting really successful quality coverage. And and do you think because so you clearly specialize right in in travel photography and you have been doing it for for years? Did it come easily for you? Was it a was it a clear decision? You know, was it a passion? You just knew it from the very beginning, or you searched a little bit for for your genre of photography in the beginning? No, do you remember those no, times? Yes, I certainly do. Um, no, the first time I. I was a working photographer when I first started traveling. I was doing weddings and portraits, but I had, I was very young. I'd set up that business with a view to traveling and shooting. 
So the first time I did my first big trip, which was seven months, and I the minute I the minute I left the country, I knew that that combination of travel and photography was for me. I just knew, and so it has proved. Fortunately, yeah, I, I would say you 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 were lucky in this regard because I you know I am struggling with this thing a little bit myself, and I know many people who are struggling with the similar thing that they actually don't know exactly what they want to shoot. You know. May it be landscapes or portraits or, or you know, or abstract images, mm. and this blocks people for for a for a, you know longer periods of time. They are kind of so they are they end end up not photographing anything and just overthinking the whole thing. W what would you suggest to a person like this? Yes, I, I sort of I get what you're saying. I think two two things. One is, as I said, I I really did start young, so I didn't give this a lot of thought. This was what I wanted to do, and I just went and did it. I didn't have to weigh up uh, whether I could earn money from it, whether I could pay for rent or food. You know, I was young enough just to forge ahead and do it. The other thing is, and this is very much my my personality. Yes, I am a travel photographer, and yes, that is specialist in terms of you know the business of travel photography. But in terms of subject matter, it covers just about everything. So, you know, I have to be able to shoot landscapes, portraits, wildlife, abstracts, absolutely everything if I wanted to make this successful from a business point of view. So I've, I've never really had to struggle with uh, subject matter. Um, what I have learned that you have to treat all the subject matter equally. So if you're really not into something, just say you're just not confident with portraits or not confident photographing people, then as a travel photographer, that is a real hindrance. So fortunately, I enjoy, and this is clear, if I didn't enjoy photographing all the different subject matter that I think you need to do, then I probably wouldn't have headed down this path. So my view is that you really need to photograph subject or content that you're passionate about, because otherwise your heart won't be in it and you won't be making the most of the opportunity. That's that's what I think. So I can imagine you are doing it mainly, even if you run workshops and educate you, but down there you are doing it mainly for yourself. Yes, absolutely. I'm shooting where I want and what I want in order to get the absolute best pictures for myself. And what I've been able to do is come up with a you know a commercial angle that allows me to make a living from this, whether it's through selling the pictures you know, on their own or publishing them in books or exhibitions or, in fact, leading tours where I can pass on some of this knowledge to other people. But, yes, I would never, for example, take a tour to somewhere that I wasn't personally, you know, really, really interested in just for the sake of it. I only go to places where I'm really excited about photographing and hopefully that, that rubs off on people and it certainly shows in the pictures. Yeah, I, I just was about to say, and then, you know, ending up there with the group. If you are excited about the place, you are you are automatically becoming a better teacher, I can imagine. Totally, yeah. And there's no point going there if you're not excited about it, because this isn't a normal job. You know, you can't just get there and say, go, go do it yourself. You know, they're there for a reason, and I'm there to give guidance. So, but it all comes back down to passion, passion about the destination, about the subject matter at the destination, and then about photography itself. How about differentiating yourself from another travel photographers? Because there is literally, we know it, hundreds of them, right? And most of the locations have been already photographed by many people before you. Uh, do, you, do, you do you even think about it or you are just simply doing your thing? I, I don't think about it much i'm certainly aware of it and we, you know what what you're referring to really is a major shift in travel photography probably in the last 10 years i guess uh maybe a little bit longer and it all came down to when it became very easy to share pictures on the internet um so no i don't think about it too much except sometimes intellectually because the reality is this is what i do is what i've always done I have no intention of changing it. I think because I got started so long ago, I've got a very strong base of images, you know, quite a large photo library to draw on. Um, 
and I've got these different strings to my travel photography bow now, which can only come with, you know, the experience and, and the years in the business. So I, I'm well aware of it, but um, no, I don't think too much about it. And uh, when looking at photographs, your own photographs, you know, from 10, 20, 30 years ago, do you sometimes get the, the urge of um, returning to any given location and creating a quote-unquote better photograph? Absolutely. That's um, that's in a way one of the privileges of the fact that I'm working in this business that I can actually go back to places. I, I go back to a lot of places anyway, even if I even if the primary motive isn't to go back and uh, create better pictures. But there's no no question. I mean, not that many of my pictures have actually survived in terms of um, quality from my very very first trip. You know, the very, very first one I did, there's probably half a dozen that have stood the test of time. But uh, the second trip I did, a lot of pictures have stood the test of time uh, because I was, I, I'd improved quite dramatically between the trips. I'd learned a lot. I'd purposely educated myself. Um, so now I do love going back to places I've been before. And even if I've got pictures that I'm happy with from previous trips, there's still so much more to photograph. And yes, I am very aware that I am still improving um, and can, you know, see, see uh, new possibilities in destinations that, I, that I've been to before, even ones that I know really well. Do you have the feeling that your photography is getting better better over the years and you know so self-improvement is it something that a photographer should be really consciously kind of monitoring over the years in order to you know grow as a photographer mm, i don't know if you need to monitor it but i, I absolutely agree agree with you I, I am getting better as a photographer every year um and i am learning all the time there's no question and i'm learning i learn on my trips when i'm taking you know clients with me I, it's amazing how much I can learn just from the group and the way people respond to places. Uh, but no, I'm very, very aware that uh, I certainly don't know everything and a lot more people know a lot more stuff than I do about photography and the whole process and the whole business of photography. So no, I I expect to keep learning um, until I stop shooting, really. Mm -hmm. So so when you look at you know, Richard Ianson's photograph from 20 years ago and today, what would you say was the main thing that, um, you know, changed or, you know, was there a vision kind of shift in your approach? No, I don't think there is. No, I don't, I don't think there is really. Um, when, when I look at the, if I mix the pictures up in, a, say, a book now or an exhibition, you, there's still a consistency. Um, I've always been big on colour and and strong colours um, and keeping the pictures fairly clean and simple, you know, not too much going on mostly. Uh, there's a definite consistency over the years. I think the big difference though now is that I am just more consistent in what I actually can uh, photograph and deliver, if you like, after a trip. So I'm probably producing more better pictures now than I did 20 years ago. So you mean consistent in terms of quality of... Yeah, totally. Yeah, quality images and yeah, that, that's what I mean. What, what is quality? Um, quality is, well, it's just the, the word I guess I was using to, um, to distinguish really good photography. So you could, you know, everyone can go to the same destination and this is harking back to one of your earlier questions, but not everybody comes away with pictures that are really good. The good photographers do and can, and they can do it consistently, and they can do it under most conditions, and they can do it regardless of camera gear, you know, mostly. Um, so I just think that there's a consistency now in the way I shoot and in the fact that I know no matter where I go, I'm going to be able to deliver pictures of a reasonably high standard um Whereas 30 years ago was probably a little bit more hit or miss. <laughs> okay. But so, but what would you say are the, I don't know if it's the, the right word here. I think gauges to measure, you know, this quality or your own growth. So like, what are those elements actually in the pictures themselves that when you say, you know, today you are producing 
a higher ratio of this high quality image? Is it composition? Is it um, storytelling in your images, which is stronger? No, it's um, it's um, it's combination. It's definitely it's it's this magic. It's finding the magic combination between the subject matter and then composing it in such a way that it's really really pleasing, a really strong composition, and then uh, creating that image in really fantastic light that suits the subject matter and the composition. So they're the three things that I'm looking for. Really, in- you know, I say interesting subject matter, but the fact is if you get the composition and the light right, you can turn some pretty mundane subject matter into pretty interesting pictures. But but even so, we, we have to start with the subject. I mean, you know, the thing that draws you or captures your attention and makes you want to photograph it in the first place. So it's a combination of subject, composition and light. They're the things that I am just always working with as I'm looking to create new pictures. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I recently watched the, the episode, you know, of the series, the, of the photography series. I, I guess it's a, correct me if I'm wrong, was it a Netflix series or National Geographic where one of the episodes is featuring you? Yes. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was produced by Canon Australia and National Geographic TV. So it was it was it was first shown on National Geographic TV, and now, uh, as of about six months ago, it's been picked up by Netflix globally. So yeah, it's still there. I saw you in action, so to speak, and it was it was kind of you know fascinating to me that because even I mean. In this particular situation, you were being filmed, you know, and there was for sure the crew around you and everything. But you basically looked like you didn't care at all. Like you entered, you were, you were, it was in India, I guess. I'm not sure now. You were following a festival, a group of, you know, people during a, some kind of festivities and y- you, you lost it. Like you were into this state of, I, I guess when you start photographing, is it correct? You kind of, yeah, you forget about everything. You kind kind of entering some kind of you know trance or meditation. Totally. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't go that far, Thomas. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a, a trance or med- meditation. But what I I can liken it to is uh, to being in the zone, say that sports people talk about. There's no no question that I get into a zone where I'm totally focused on doing what I'm doing, and it doesn't really matter what else is going on. Um, I'm just very clear about what I'm doing and it, and uh yeah when that happens the pictures often are the best pictures for sure Richard the the last thing I ask my guests about is to to give uh photography radio listeners a small assignment you know something they could try doing today or maybe this week something that would help them with improving their own photography or maybe simply just you know make them explore a a, a new way of doing things would you have some kind of a small assignment for us today there is one one thing you can do it's sort of any on any location and that is to find a really interesting location make sure you study the light which means you might have to go back so that you're there when the light is really good and complementary to the um, situation and then add to that situation a dynamic element so when I think about this I just think about um, I've done this lots of times. I do it everywhere. I'll look for a location that's interesting and then I'll wait for a person to walk through. Not necessarily just walk through, but a person who might have clothing on that is complementary to the situation or they make a particular sort of movement. They turn their head so they're not just sort of stationary. For example, you know, pick out a beautiful wall covered in a fantastic graffiti or a a, a street art mural and then wait for people to walk past that the person is the dynamic element that person is only there very momentarily and depending on where you place them on their particular pose maybe on what they're wearing you can create a picture that then can't be repeated so that's what I'm always looking for if I find a location that I find really attractive sure I'll shoot the location because it's attractive but the really interesting pictures 
and the ones that are personally challenging to get, photographically challenging, and therefore the most satisfying when you nail it is when you add this thing called a dynamic, I'm calling it a dynamic element, something that's not normally there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, w- wonderful tip, wonderful, you know, idea. Let, let's do it. Let's, let's, you know, <laughs> keep practicing. And, um, yeah, Richard, thanks so much. W- what's next in your calendar? Where are you? Where are you next week? <laughs> well, I got, I got home two days ago from Iran, Georgia and Armenia. And in one month's time, I'm going to, uh, Kamchatka, uh, in Eastern, Eastern Russia. Yeah. So that's going to be pretty, pretty exciting. More of a wilderness trip than an, than an urban trip, yeah. Enjoy, Richard. Have a, have a wonderful light, right? <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. And uh, meet you soon, hopefully. See you again in Lucerne one day, absolutely. Thanks so much, Richard. Bye-bye. Okay, see ya. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Hit subscribe on your podcast app, it would mean a lot for us to have you as our regular listener. Head over to photographyradio.com to drop your suggestion for future editions of Photography Radio or simply to say hello. We would absolutely love to hear from you. In the meantime, have a wonderful night and we will be back with more photography in your ears very soon.